If anybody can remember, we had these classifications of volume visualization techniques. One was direct versus indirect volume rendering, and one was object order versus image order volume rendering. Marching cubes is object order, and <clears throat> it is, anybody remember if it's image based or object based? Anybody remember what those terms mean? Bueller. Is the attendance register somewhere? Everybody signed it? Anybody remember? So lots of people are If that's an object, if margin cubes is an object order or image order. Anybody, well, you have a 50 50 chance of guessing correctly. <coughs> Luke, what do you think? Is marching cubes an image order or object order technique? Object. Object, correct. I knew you knew it. I knew it. You're hiding, <coughs> hiding your viz knowledge. So now we're going to move on to direct visualization, direct volume visualization. And what we mean by indirect is all the data samples that we see on an isosurface are interpolated. But can we, can we use the data samples directly rather than interpolating new ones all the time? And using the originals is called, can be called direct volume visualization. Can anybody think of a disadvantage of the marching cubes algorithm? Can anybody think of a disadvantage? That is a, that is a, <clears throat> that's a difficult advanced question. You'd have to be, name? Uh, Joe. Joe. Might be processing some stuff that you don't really need right now. So, say part of the object is occluded when you're looking at it from a certain angle, you don't necessarily need to process that bit right now. That is very correct. Okay, <clears throat> marching cubes. Get anybody want to guess what the most common case is in marching cubes? Remember those 15 <clears throat> cases that I showed? what the most common one is? I suppose it's a hard question without being able to see the 15 cases. The empty one? The first one? Exactly, exactly, the empty one. So marching cube spends most of its processing time traversing empty cubes. Because if you think about it, if you have a surface in a 3D volume, it, it usually doesn't intersect the cubes. Right? It's not too difficult to imagine a sphere in a cube that most of the cubes do not get intersected. That's, that's one of the disadvantages. Another disadvantage is that it implies certainty. So you are shown a surface and you look at that surface and you think it's certain. In other words, there's no uncertainty. All data has a certain amount of error associated with it. No matter what 
instrument you use to collect your data, it has error. So when you get a thermometer, let's say you look up the temperature on your phone, you see like eight degrees Celsius, but that's not true actually. Well, it's partially true. It's more true to say eight degrees Celsius plus or minus one degree. That's more honest, it's more truthful. And that plus or minus one degree is uncertainty. And it's the same for surfaces. You know, they're not 100% certain and under normal circumstances. And another, another aspect is real surfaces are actually have some, some thickness to them, right? If you model a surface based on triangles, it's infinitely thin. It has no thickness at all. But in reality, surfaces do have thickness. And you might be wondering why I'm talking about this. It's because it leads into the next subject nicely. Yeah, and it's also good. good um, those are good test questions, <laughs> you know, for the advanced understanding parts. Maybe I'll use, since since this lecture is not heavily attended, maybe I'll use this lecture to talk about the tests. What do you guys think? Seems like a reasonable strategy. I would say the lower the attendance is, the more likely I am to start talking about the test. <laughs> Anyways, those are some disadvantages of marching cubes. The processing empty cells, the, the implicit certainty and the lack of thickness in the surfaces, those are three. The ambiguous cases is all, can also be on you as a, as a disadvantage. So we're going to spam you with new terminology now. And some of it's very useful for assignment two. So hang on to your hats for terminology. So direct volume visualization, you've already heard this term. There's no necessarily intermediate representation. In other words, we're not always interpolating new data samples. The imagery is closer to real 3D. In other words, we are going to see surfaces using direct volume rendering but the surfaces have some fuzziness or some depth to them. They are not infinitely thin anymore. And they can actually reflect uncertainty. And we, the, we talked about object order, matching cubes. We're going to talk about image order rendering. And there are multiple direct volume visualization techniques, just as there are multiple indirect, like slicing and isosurface extraction. And we're going to talk about a few of them. One's called ray casting, one's called the shear warp algorithm. We won't talk about texture mapper, mapping due to time constraints. And there are various rendering techniques, like compositing, maximum intensity projection, first hit, and averaging. These sound very, very fancy, and, and in some ways they are, but they all address the same fundamental question, which is, given a 3D volume, which subset of that 3D volume do you look at? Because you can't look at the whole thing at the same time. In slices, you choose the position of this 2D plane, and that's the subset you look at. In isosurfaces, you're always choosing a surface, which is a subset of the volume, and you look at a, a certain surface or a certain number of surfaces together. But you're making a, a, a decision, which subset of the volume do I want to look at? These things called rendering techniques make that same decision. Which subset of the volume do I look at? 
at because we can't look up at it all at once. So here's a new term, ray casting, and I think a lot of you have heard the term ray tracing. It's similar but not the same. So ray casting, in ray casting the value of each pixel in the image is determined by sending a ray through the pixel into the scene. And we saw this image already when we described image order. Volume visualization, this is the screen. This is the viewer over here, not shown, looking through the screen, so to speak. And this is the, the data, the volumetric data. And you can imagine going from like top left to right, and then the next row in a rasterized fashion, pixel by pixel, cat in for each pixel, casting a ray into the volume, sampling the data along the ray, and then computing a color and opacity based on the sampling of the, the ray. And Here's, here's the, that, that same idea using different pictures. Here is a pixel. You know, we're, we're here looking at the image. This is one pixel, and we have to compute a color and opacity for the pixel, RGB alpha values. We can do so by, by casting a ray into the volume. Right? The ray hits the, the edge of the volume. And then we can compute something called an intensity profile, which is shown here. The intensity profile is a, is a depth versus scalar value 2D function. So along the x-axis of this 2D function is the depth into the volume, one-to-one -one mapping. And along the y-axis, which happens to be the same y-axis as the volume, is the scalar value that we encounter along the ray as it goes from front to back. It's also called an intensity profile. So here we've hit, we've hit the entrance or the side of the volume and we hit a very low intensity. Right? It's low. Right, if, if this is the scale from zero to maximum. Anybody know why that's low here? Why that's a low value? Anyone want to take a guess? It's because, it's an advanced question by the way, it's because the first thing we hit is air. Like right, when, we're, when we're sampling the volume, see there's a, there's a, this is a medical data set. The first thing we hit is air, which is a low density or a low scalar value. So it corresponds to a low uh, intensity profile. And then we hit an actual object in the volume when we get inside the volume. And it has a non-trivial value of a non-trivial scalar value. So the ray will hit like the skin first, then soft tissue, then bone tissue, and so on. And every time it hits a different kind of tissue, the intensity or the scalar value will change along the, the ray. And these, these different rendering techniques or ray functions decide, uh, they decide which subset of the volume to return, you know. In other words, like, which subset of the volume do we actually see? And they determine that by computing for every pixel a color and an opacity. So here are four different options. Now this, this is an intensity profile. Along the x-axis is the depth into the volume, and on the y-axis is the scalar values. That is the same as these two axes here. So we're looking at one ray as it's cast into the volume and sampling 
the three D volume along its along its path. And these are the actual scalar values as we move into the volume along a, a, a given ray. Now we can decide as we're sampling the volume from front to back what values to return and base our decision as to like what we see. What part of the 3D volume do we actually see? So one of them is called maximum intensity projection. And that means we return the maximum value that we encounter along the ray, whatever that happens to be. We sample every data point along the ray, and we just return the maximum value that we, that we intersect. Another one is compositing. And that is we just add all the values that we encounter up, just add them up and return that. Another one is called x-ray or average. That is adding up all of the values we encounter along the ray in the 3D volume and then normalizing it. So averaging it by dividing by the number of samples that we actually encounter. So if we sample de 10 data samples, so we, we, we uh, take 10 data samples, then we have to divide by 10. Another option is called first hit, and that means return the first data sample that we that is non-zero when we cast it into the volume. So those are four different options. <clears throat> Here are some examples. So for a medical data set, the scan of somebody's head. In this case, the values that correspond to air are, are ignored. So then it just skipped. We don't, we're not usually interested in seeing air inside the 3D volume. <clears throat> so here we used first hit, a first hit ray function to return the first value which we see in the volume when we cast our rays. And that is, in this example, the skin, right? Because that's the outer layer of the cadaver. It's the first thing that the ray hits in a 3D volume. This is what it looks like when we use average or that the, the result looks like an x-ray. <clears throat> so this is returning the average value of all the pixels that we, of all the voxels that we sample. This is an example of returning the, the highest intensity value that we encounter along each ray in the volume. Anybody recognize what this, this is? Name? Nick. Nick. The latency of your camera. That's right, that's right, good, very good. And here's a compositing example. It's similar to the x-ray example. So you can see that like the, the compositing and the accumulate have this special property that you get like an average view almost. You, you, you get a, a view that doesn't just target one object. Like it doesn't just give you the skin or the bones. It gives you multiple, it returns multiple objects. In, in other words, you, we can make transparent layers, transparent layers visible. Right? And this, it looks to me like a heart, some sort of a heart. 
Here are some more examples, like compositing, adding shading to the surfaces, another maximum intensity projection example, x-ray example. This one is adding this. This is another transfer function. We could, we could have a array function that just returns the edges or the contours of the volume to enhance the contours. Any questions so far? So lots of new terminology just now, like a lot of new terms. And actually, let me back up for a second. Okay, I won't, I won't, uh, I was thinking about showing a video, but I will delay that. Who here took, isn't there a class on like m medical image analysis or something like that? Is there, do we offer a class on medical image analysis? Has anybody, has anybody ever heard of that? Okay, maybe we don't. I thought we might have. We, this is just one slide to clarify this term classification. But you could take like a module on this topic. You could take an entire module on this, this topic of, of classification. And that is assigning, essentially in its essence, is assigning data values to a known object which means something. So if we have a, of some volume data and we every at every vertex in the volume, there's a data sample. Well, rather than just treating it as a number, we can, we can classify every number by the um, subset of the data that it represents. So in the case of an MRI scan or a CT scan, every data sample corresponds to a part of the human body, like skin, soft tissue, bone, and so on. Assi this assignment of data value to object is called classification. That's what this term means in this context. Identifying the data semantics, ordering the objects and identifying them like bones and skin. That means every data sample belongs to some subset. And in the ideal world, this could be done fully automatically. You could just input a 3D volume or a 2D slice and then come up with an algorithm that classifies it. it says these data values all represent the skin. These data values all represent bone. These data values all represent soft tissue, like veins or kidneys or heart. That's kind of, that's the holy grail to have an algorithm that can fully, automatically classify all the data values to, to objects that we know about. That's also called segmentation. So to divide up the data values and categorize them. We're gonna talk about a way to do that in this data visualization class, but it is a huge topic. It's a huge topic in image processing. Like it, it could be its own class, it could be its own module. But it's a, it's a very big topic. It's good if you know what that term means. Here's another new term, a transfer function. And you saw it being used in assignment two, the description of assignment two. An operation that maps scalar values in 3D to color opacity and our texture values. That's my own definition, nothing fancy. So in this case, it's a ray function that takes each 3D value that we find in the volume and then maps it to a color and opacity generally. So a scalar value 
to a color. You're all very familiar, by the way, with just taking a set of scalar values and mapping them to a color. You did that in assignment one. You have a bunch of values and you color map them. Like red means hot temperature and blue means cold temperature. And you didn't use those in assignment one probably, but you probably did something like red means high disease prevalence and blue means low disease prevalence or something like that. And you used other colors too, like green. Here it's the same thing, but we're talking more than just color. We're adding this opacity aspect. And why are we adding that? It's because we're now we're looking into a 3D volume and we don't want to see everything at once. We just want to see subsets of the 3D volume. We want to be able to see inside. So we have to make decisions about what's opaque that we can see and what's transparent that we kind of ignore. Like in the medical data, air is typically ignored, but we want to see the other objects. So some decisions have to be made with respect to what's visible, what's invisible, what's opaque and what's transparent. And we do this using transfer functions in, in direct volume rendering. So a one-dimensional transfer function, in the one-dimensional transfer function, the 1D refers to the data. Data is mapped to color. You already know that from assignment one. And data is also mapped to opacity. So here's an example of a transfer function. Data is mapped to color. And data is also mapped to opacity. So along the x-axis, data is mapped to color. In this case, air, <coughs> data that corresponds to air is mapped to the color black or, or no color. Data that corresponds to skin or skin values is mapped to the color yellow. That's this, this, this yellow in the picture. And data value that's high in density is mapped to, is, corresponds to the bone tissue, and it gets the color red in this example. So that's not too shocking. Anybody see another color in there? I got the, I got the uh, this is like a transfer function right here. <laughs> transfer the list of people here. How about Edward? Is Edward Bramworth yeah. here? Ed, what do you think? Is there another color in there? <laughs> so we saw that that air is mapped to black or, or transparent then then skin or or intermediate middle values are mapped to yellow yeah. high values are mapped to red yeah is there are there any other colors in this image yes yeah, blue. blue exactly what are those blue teeth, teeth exactly and they're the highest density. There really should be a blue. There should be a blue here. This is like an error in the slide, essentially. Good. You're awake now. <laughs> Don't, I, I, it's not a big deal. I fell asleep in many, many lectures. I, used to, I learned to bring coffee with me to lectures so I, to keep me awake. But there's more than just a color mapping going on here. There's also an opacity mapping, the opposite of transparency, by the way, opacity, how opaque something is, which is the opposite of how transparent something is. So data is also mapped to opacity. This is low opacity, and this is high opacity. And data is mapped to this, op this opacity scale or axis. This is low opacity, 
low data values or small data values that correspond to air, if this is a density field, by the way, get high transparency or low opacity. So you can see right through them. That's what, that's what this transfer function is, is telling us. Middle values that correspond roughly to skin are yellow here on the, on the x-axis, but they're semi-transparent on the opacity axis. So here you can see some skin values, but they're not fully opaque. They're semi-transparent. And then we can keep moving up. As the data density value goes up, bones, for example, the opacity also goes up. So these become the most visible. They're the most opaque. And then, again, the, the teeth are there. So the teeth are the most dense, and they get very high opacity again. So we can see them. Does that make sense? So every data value is being assigned a color and an opacity, not just the color that you used to. It's, it's so we can see through things that might be less important and then see things that we think are more important. Hopefully that made sense. And it's called a 1D transfer function because it's data being mapped twice. Of course, we see other examples. And why is this important? It's because all the volume rendering pieces of software that you use ask you to configure a transfer function. You have to decide, okay, what data values get what colors and what data values get opacities, which opacities, not just the color balance. So these transfer functions decide which subset of the volume you see. It's not very hard to imagine. So here's a subset of a volume, and here's the corresponding transfer function. And here's the same volume with a different transfer function. So you see the, the same volume in very different ways depending on how you configure your transfer function, which is not too surprising. Here are some more examples. Right, this in this example, the air got the high opacity. This is basically air. And the the the, the person that's adjusting the transfer function is lowering the the opacity of, of the low density data values. So they're increasing the opacity of the high density data values as with, the, with each image. The colors are not generally changing, in, in, at least in what I see, the colors are generally not changing. It's only the opacity that's changing so they've stuck with the color, and then they're just changing the opacity. But you get very different views of the inside of this volume, depending on your transfer function. That's the point. And this is a scan of a lobster. Here's another example. Right, same data set. Toes, toes of a foot. Anybody, have, have you ever heard, since you're all very young, you might not have heard this, but has anybody heard that x-ray machines used to be used in shoe stores? Has anybody ever heard that before? So when x-ray machines for, were first invent, invented, they were used in shoe shops to measure the size of your foot. And then, then the, the, the deleterious effects of x-ray machines was discovered, and they were quickly banned from the, the shoe stores. Little history, like random, random pub quiz history. This reminds me of that, because it looks sort of like an x-ray, one of the images. 
of, and I think toe, I see toes, and then I think of those x-ray machines. I've never seen them, I just heard about them. Okay, we could introduce some more terminology, but I think we're going to stop there. Any questions before we stop? Good luck, assignment two. And I'm sure that the scores on assignment one will be outstanding. Confident. This is a smart class. Mm -hmm.